I want to thank the listeners for joining us, and we have a very special guest today, Victoria Maxwell, who's famous, bipolar famous, uh, Canadian super famous. That's I know this for sure. Naked psychosis famous. <laughs> naked psychosis famous. We have what is up with this naked thing? You and I both have this. I know. There's a lot of people. There's a big group of people that are part of that camp. It's a it's a it's a good camp to be part of, I think. Sort of. I, I think so too. If you haven't done the naked psychosis, you haven't really done it yet. Well, I would I I temper that only because I think, you know, yeah, if if you've done the psychosis and you haven't done the naked stuff, don't aim for naked psychosis. Like just know that your psychosis is enough as it is. We accept all psychosis, all psychosis on this show. That's right. All Hands psychosis is, is welcome. Every <laughs> variety, every shape and size. Absolutely. Little ones, big ones, bad mm -hmm. ones, scary ones, paranoid ones, all of them. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. That's really important to bring in. <laughs> it is, you know. Yeah. And if you haven't had a psychosis, I'm totally open to that too. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. We'll accept them. Yeah. <laughs> with, with a small caveat. Which, which is just that they have not had the experience. I want that to be acknowledged, you know. Well, that's true. That's true. But you know, then it, then it becomes you know disorder comparison and you know and, and all that kind of stuff. So we don't want that divisiveness, right? That's true. Chris? I agree. I agree. And uh, Lama Rod, my one of my very f uh, favorite spiritual teachers, called it the oppression Olympics. He says we're not going to get anywhere. Doing yeah. this oppression Olympics. Yeah, that's right. I think that's, that's right. really nice. So yeah. let's cut to your story because you have this amazing, <laughs> amazing story that bridges spiritual emergency and bipolar symptoms and accepting a diagnosis and everything. And it's kind yeah. of, I think, out of all the famous bipolar people, you are the one that I relate to the story the most. And I think that's important for me to just say right off the bat. But I'd like to hear your story, if you to say something about what it was like to have this um, both aspects and how you came to hold both aspects. Uh, yeah, it's um, uh, it, it was painful, like I think uh, many people's journey is, in the, particularly in the beginning. Um, and even... Well, and so I'll go back to sort of the, my story, Cole's note version, is I uh, was an actor when I was in my 20s, and I was progressively getting more depressed for a number of reasons, partially not getting acting work, um, always had a propensity to it, runs in my family on both sides, anxious, things like that. And then as I progressively got more and more depressed, um, I the nature of depression is a lack of meaning for most people's experience. So I started to try a whole bunch of different things. Nothing was helping. Uh, and then decided that, well, to find meaning, you usually find a spiritual path. So that's what I started on. And so I went to a, a, a satsang or a group that was in uh, Vancouver, BC. And there was a group of people who were students of a gentleman, H.W.L. Uh, Punja, so a teacher in India. Mm. And um, anyway, and so it was really Advaita Vedanta kind of, uh, his teacher was Ramana Maharshi. Uh, so for, for those of the viewers and listeners who know it, it's non-dualism, all that. And so I went into um, uh, self-inquiry of who am I? And it was really the first time that I had done any meditation. It was like a three-day retreat. I wasn't staying at the the uh, the house. It was just a house, um, but it was a very intense. And so what I learned very quickly is that um, meditators who don't prepare, who might have like I have mental health issues on both sides of my family. I was very greedy, <laughs> wanted to get enlightened because I was really feeling like if I got enlightened, I wouldn't feel depressed or suicidal or anxious or anything. And um, But what did happen was as I was doing the meditation, I my sense of self disappeared. And it really became when I read 
afterwards, a classic Kundalini crisis, a classic um, peak experience, all the trappings of where I I was in complete bliss. I, you know, all the uh, thoughts stopped. And what also happened though is that because my system wasn't prepared, and anyone like with the Kundalini crisis, the energy goes up from the bottom of the spine and sort of shoots right up the the spine and past all the chakras and any crap that you haven't dealt with gets triggered and it was just too much for me to contain and so that's when the line becomes unclear that I wasn't holding this spiritual expansion well and it was called a psychosis but it was for me particularly profound and meaningful. I mean, I, although I, so I, I went in and out of, um, when I say contact with reality, so there were some things that I was misinterpreting that were what I would call floridly psychotic, like where they, where it wasn't helpful, it wasn't adaptive, and other times where it was just oneness with God. So anyway, I uh, was staying with my parents they knew something was wrong because at times I was not making sense when I was talking. And uh, they took me to the emergency and I was committed. And uh, I have a whole other opinion about being committed. And surprisingly or not, uh, it for me, it was one of the safest places for me to be. Um, because uh, And I also had good care there. What happened afterwards is what was difficult is that my experience of that profound personal experience of the spiritual one was profoundly pathologized. So no one explored with me what I found beneficial uh, about that, that experience. And whether or not they were literally saying it, what I heard them say is, you either have to choose between your spiritual path or being crazy or and taking medication so we can stop it so that is one of the reasons why it took five years for me to really uh accept uh some other kinds of treatment uh, so i tried many other ways of um coping and uh managing my life but each time i would i would end up um sort of crash and burning. So the, the suicidal thoughts got to be too much. Um, meditation didn't help. Um, eating differently didn't help. All these different things. And so I was in and out of the psych ward. And so eventually, um, because I felt like I didn't have any of other choice, that uh, I needed to I'll accept some of the medical treatment. And it wasn't until... Um, and, and the naked psychosis part happened sort of in between there. Um, I also went to India, uh, much to my parents' horror, um, after this psychosis and before I had even accepted the illness. So my parents, uh, bless their souls, had to wait nine months while I was in India. They knew that I wasn't accepting treatment or med medication or anything. So their... Um, the idea of being able to be in India, I feel very lucky to have been there, but I also know I was very lucky to have not had something that was uh, like a dire psychiatric emergency or a spiritual emergency. Um, and so anyway, and so I came back and then I had another episode, but that was the naked running down the street episode. And um, it wasn't until I was in the hospital and I met a nurse who said to me, uh, I was refusing to take medication and she asked why and I told her my story and she said, you know, sometimes when you touch that limitless part of yourself in meditation, it can be overwhelming. And honestly, to this day, like I don't even know who she was, but that gave me some hope that someone was able to say, hey, you had something really important happen and you may need some extra help. 
And she said it with such compassion that there was no judgment involved. And so I started to uh, befriend her. And then she told me about a psychiatrist who sort of had a similar perspective. And that was the beginning of what I feel like where I I was starting to um, get back on my feet and learning to live better um, and eventually well with bipolar disorder or whatever you, or whatever you want to call it um i get i feel like i get i get no pun intended i get straight jacketed with all these words and labels um so um and this uh, psychiatrist dr dylan um just helped me you know he sort of said so is is meditation enough to keep me well and it wasn't and Reiki wasn't and aromatherapy wasn't and all the other things that I wanted it to be enough wasn't. And so he finally um, said, well, why don't we try medication? And so then I worked with him to find the right medication and it took a couple of years, but we did. And um, that was sort of the beginning where I felt like I had to blend both. And um, I know that there's, there's a part of me that wishes in some ways that I had had the resources to see if I could have moved through all my psychoses without having to go into the psych ward without all this. But in some ways, then it automatically puts a judgment on me that I wasn't like, and I don't know, this has been my path. And um, I say to anyone who's had these kind of experiences, whatever works for you, Whatever allows you to live a good quality of life, like a joyful, vibrant life, that's the way to go. If it was standing on my head and eating, I don't know, spinach every morning, then that'd be great. You know, awesome. If it includes having both medication and essential oils, which it does, <laughs> then that's my path. So that, so I'm sort of like a, 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 a yes and kind of girl. You know, the either or trappings are really challenging because I think that it's people like us that that are weighing in the balance. It's not like uh, feuding between whether or not there's some sort of total recovery or not. It, yeah. Yeah. To me, that that's not really serving anything. It's like, yeah. why can't we validate where, where anyone is? Yeah. And and I think what where I see it is that... Some, many people have been really traumatized by the mental health system and are still caught and are, uh, you know, it's been a horrible experience. So it's, for me, it's, it's recognizing everybody's experiences individual, just like everybody's um, tools for wellness are individual. Mm -hmm. Um, There's some that are um, typically that we know are helpful, but I, and it was interesting. I talked to a naturopath recently, um, at a networking event and, um, she heard what I did. I speaking and performing at conferences. She said, Oh, you might be great for our conference. And I went, um, but you know, like I talk about like psychiatric medication, you know, and she said, no, no, I know. And in, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but in Canada, they're able to um, prescribe prescriptions. But we ended up talking about the fact that, at least for her, she recognizes that all of it is medicine. So, and my, the the medication that I take um, is only a part of all those other tools. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, exercise, counseling, uh, essential oils, um, qigong, uh, all those things. So uh, the idea of having to sort of put one wellness tool in one camp as natural and more holistic, uh, I think, like you said, does a disservice to people. And it put, I, for me, it put me at odds with myself because I could feel like, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll push through uh, and have a mil- miserable experience uh, if I'm not going to take the medication that works for me. Um, and I think also in terms of medication, it's about uh, minimizing the harm and the, um, the the side effects. And so I feel very fortunate because my medication, I have very few side effects and it's very effective for me. So 
I have an advantage that way. I may I might feel differently if if I had a lot of side effects and my liver was blasted because of, you know, certain things or whatever. So mm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you bring up two really important points, at least for me, is one is there are people that are harmed, there are people that are misdiagnosed, there are people that are over medicated or unskillfully medicated. Yeah. And I think that it's human nature to try to apply our own experience and, and sort of project it and overlay it onto our world. Yeah. And so if something happened to me and I hear some similarity in another person's story, there's a kind of basic assumption or bias that we have of then, well, then what worked for me will work for you. Right. Yeah. If what was wrong for me is wrong for you, then right. what worked yes. for me yeah. will work for you. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really, and I think you know the whole psychiatric system and the the pharmaceutical companies. It's riddled with controversy, and so uh, but allowing that to be separate from well, what's working? Like what works for a person? And I mean, if I didn't have to take medication, I'd be thrilled. I'd be thrilled um, as long as I had a good quality of life. And you know, and I, I look in to be perfectly honest envy and a bit of jealousy when I see people who have been able to go under the the tutelage of someone who's a shaman. I'm going, I, that's me. I want that. Something and that I've spent a great deal of time thinking about in my own reflections on the limitations of the body versus spiritual awakening is there are, there's a whole history of teachers who um, die early. So they're like Paramahansa Yogananda, who was so influential to me and brilliant. And I was like, so into the yoga of Jesus, like just changed my life. So, you know, he, he died very young. And I wonder about his nervous system and the kind of, there's some theories around Kundalini, um, burning out the nervous system faster or something like that. So that's really interesting to me, and he had a kind of a dark night at the end of his life around what you know what was really happening and really working. If people want to check that out, Awake, the documentary is amazing. Um, oh, goodness. And then Krishnamurti died of, I think, cancer. Um, um, I could be wrong on that, but it was something, some kind of terminal illness like that, and um, of course, my uh, someone who I feel so connected to in spirit and in, in intellectually as well as uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who founded Naropa and the Shambhala International. And he died with a failed liver, and there's all this stuff around alcoholism and stuff like that. And yeah. so, so to me, I'm like, you know, it's not the same. Physical health is not the same as spiritual insight. No, no. And, and why can't the nervous system have issues just like any other part of the body? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know who I forgot to mention? Who? Ra Ram Das. I love Ram Das. Ram Das had a stroke, you know. Did you see his have you seen his new documentary? Yes, the th the short one. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Yeah, I know. I'm really excited to see it. It's 100% really amazing. So, okay, so here so here we are and we're at the juncture where it's like we, we're holding, I feel like, and I hope that listeners are hearing this and viewers are hearing this, that here we have you who has had these great spiritual experiences um, and then also are able to hold both, the kind of non-duality of like, okay, my nervous system is jacked up, my, my brain gets jacked up, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it's not uh, – it needs to be anything more than the filter of spirit and what I'm able to integrate or not integrate, or, you know, maybe yeah. you have more insight because of the loose. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's more holes in the fabric, right? <laughs> I got more holes in the fabric. <laughs> right. So more, maybe more light is coming through. It's, that's right. It's spaciousness. Yes. It's all about spaciousness. So <laughs> Emptiness, right? right? <laughs> yeah. It, so to me, I'm like, why, why can't it be just like anything else? Like, um, you know, maybe somebody's an amazing spiritual teacher and they have lower back pain like Pima Chodron or they have right. gastrointestinal pain like Aja yeah. Shanti, you know, like yeah. um, someone who I love very dearly. 
the point is all these teachers have bodies that are imperfect. Yeah. And it's not a reflection of their spiritual wisdom. It's right. because we live in a body. That's, that's what it is. And I've learned to, uh, accept that it's mine is highly sensitive and I need certain things that are very concrete to help me move through this world really well. And to, for me to be of the most service. Mm -hmm. So I'm of, no use when I'm pushing up against the river of, no, I don't want to take medication. No, I don't want to accept it. You know, and you can call it whatever you, you want, but I know there's certain things that I need to do on a daily basis. And some of them come with my own judgments around them that I've learned to just go, oh yeah, there's the judgment. And that mindfulness has been really helpful. And so I think some of the, the things that have occurred uh, for me in the spiritual experiences have helped me in my recovery. They've been essential to my recovery. And so I think when I was talking about the difference between my mind and my brain, my brain has a certain capacity, certain wirings, neural pathways. My mind is separate from my brain. Um, and so to me, the things that occur uh, that are symptoms, depression, mania, anxiety, there are chemical shifts in my body, my physical body. In my mind, my spirit, that shift doesn't happen. And so the more I identify with my mind or the more that I identify with that self, um, the more that I can know and be discerning about the best tools for my body. Mm -hmm. and, and my brain is including that. And it's the same thing, brain, lower back, you know, ulcer, colitis, herpes, whatever. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, something that's coming through for me is uh, the whole, the Buddha, the historical Buddha apparently went out and said, look, there's inevitable old age, sickness and death. Yeah. Yeah, old age sickness and death and i i think there's a kind of internalized materialism or health uh like bodily health consciousness yeah that likes to imagine that we'll get old and we'll die but we won't get sick yeah 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 you know? and i think to some degree some people don't even think they're going to get old like i keep i keep trying this as a total like aside but i keep remembering that right now you know, people may complain of however old you are, right? You're going, oh, I'm so old or whatever. Maybe you don't, but, and then I'm going, yeah, but one day I'm going to be like, I'm going to be wrinkled, like wrinklier and gray and like a senior citizen. And I'm going to look back when I was 53 going, God, I didn't know how good I had it. <laughs> and so, and so I'm like, going, yeah, I'm 53. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, you're totally right. I mean, I could. I coach clients that are in their early 20s and they're like freaking out because they don't know – they they're like, I haven't figured out my whole entire life yet. And I'm like, you're in your early 20s. Chill. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. There's you time. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, I think this is very – this is very healing you know, to me and I, I hope to others. And there was a – there was an article you wrote and uh, – I want to direct people to your Psychology Today blog, and uh, I'll put links to your newsletter and everything. But there was a, a particular article that you wrote, and it was it was basically about like uh, accepting the diagnosis and then getting to a point where you're like, well, maybe I, you know, I've been doing enough qigong, I got enough essential oils and meditation practice, and I, yeah, yeah. I I'm a, I'm more wise and all this stuff. And you were like, well, maybe I could get off medication and yeah. can you say something about what that was like because a lot of people are struggling with yeah two or not to and all that uh yeah um let's see i know that i go through periods where i think it's i'd be more spiritual if i was off my meds that my spiritual development would accelerate um and one that assumes that uh spirituality is the top priority and it, in some ways it again um differentiates living in this uh physical world is different than 
my spiritual life. They're one and the same. It's like my mind, body, one and the same. So that's one thing that I've gained at, insight to is that if I'm not able to find the sacredness in this, in quotes, mundane world, I'm missing the point. Mm. Um, secondly, this idea that um, I think where it came from was this thought that, well, if I am not on pharmaceutical meds, then maybe my chi will be flowing better. I'll be healthier. It'll be um, I'll be more grounded. I'll have all these other things, access to my um, intuitive and psychic uh, abilities more, things like that. And um, and so and there was a judgment that somehow if I was really committed to my wellness, I would with, you know, I would try to wean off my medication. And there's been a number of times when I've tried to do that. Uh, and I've done it both with, uh, like, always with this, a psychiatrist supervision. But what I found was when I'm, when I stop or reduce my medication, I always experience some of those withdrawal symptoms, but the struggle I have every day trying to feel connected and of value and being able to be of service is diminished. And what I have experienced is when I am on the medication that I take now, I feel way more connected to God. I am far more creative. My creativity is more sustainable. And I keep going, and I say God, universe, source, whatever you want to call higher power, nothingness, whatever, that those things, um, that why would I separate that psychiatric medication is any different than the medicine that I hold in higher regard, like homeopath homeopathy or um, Chinese herbal medicine or acupuncture and things like that. Um, because, you know, homeopathy, if you take a large enough dose, it'll kill you. <laughs> and so, you know, the fact that there's this idea that psychiatric medication is, is uh, not natural, it all comes from the natural world. It's just different how it comes. And so it was a, a process of recognizing that if I really want to be um, of service and be my better self or best self and feel like I can contribute, I needed just to look at um, the evidence that when I'm trying to not take medication out of some intellectual and really ego-based idea, because it's it was only an idea where, you know, I think it's better. I shouldn't be on it. My life was not. I was not functioning well. Mm -hmm. When I take medication along with all the other stuff, therapy, exercise, eating well, qigong, meditation, I thrive, and so I enjoy my life more, and I can be there for my family. So when I look at those two things. I may feel that this is morally superior or this is what I did. And I went, it's not, it's not, it's just, it's called bullheadedness. <laughs> and so uh, it was a, a process of just continuing to look at that. And I still run up against it. I think that there's times where I will look at how do I feel now? And there's still that veil of, I don't know whether it's a desire to sort of just try it one more time, or maybe it's not going to happen. Um, but it, it does, and I and I and it's a it's been a journey of surrender and acceptance, mm -hmm. and not knowing why. Because I because I I think what it is is that I compare like in the twelve step group where they talk about don't compare your uh, insides with other people's outsides. Um, being able to recognize that. When I see other people and they're not on medication and they're functioning well and all that kind of stuff, and I go, that's what I think I want. And I'm going, yeah, but when I do that, I don't work, it, I don't, it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know the reasons why. 
And that's one of the things that I had to let go of is understanding why. And there's a bit of grief around it, to be honest, because I, you know, had, uh, it, there's sort of an idea of how I thought that I should be able to manage and that's not happening. But the way I am managing is pretty darn okay. And um, to me, that's what's important. That's the, that's the, if anything that when people are hearing this or, or watching this is that letting, being able to let go of what it looks like works for other people and really taking a, a honest appraisal of, well, what really works for me and what allows me to thrive? Um, because it took me a while to accept that, no, this is what it is. And then those things that I saw as limitations, I can integrate and I then I don't burn bridges and I'm able to function in a way that I never thought I'd be able to function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful because you're touching on something that I really feel myself, which is that the reason I take medication is not is not so much because I think there's something wrong with me or something like that, but it's like it's the space between me and my world and the relationships I want to maintain, how I want to show up, who I want to be to ser uh, service to. And the reality is like I can't be a partner. I can't be a father. I can't uh, hopefully validate people's spiritual growth no matter where they are in a kind of psychiatric or bipolar continuum. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't get to do this work. I don't get to do this interview without that. And yeah. to me, that's a, and this might be, this might just be me uh, giving, giving each other a pat on the back or something, kudos. <laughs> but I think that's a, that's a non-duality that transcends the kind of big duality that people get stuck in where they're othering their own bodies, their own brains, yeah. their, the way that they want to be in the world. And, and the reality is like, I'm, I have not incarnated in a world that supports a bipolar body any more than I've incarnated into a bipolar body that's able to participate in the world. It's that's a yeah. high, high level of non-duality, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the biggest thing for me is about using our curiosity, right? So that I don't, I don't know all the ins and outs of. Uh, or the reasons why about my experience and if it's so why I remain as curious about my own and then hopefully I'm as curious to others like understanding what propels people if if they're um very defended about one position um and usually to me it because it, it comes from fear and um or anger and under anger is usually hurt right so um most times when I know people are very against something that I might be doing, um, it's because they've had a very different experience and it's not been a good one. Mm -hmm. And so I go, yeah, I can understand why you wouldn't want it. And that's totally fine. I mean, I my hope is just that people uh, stay as safe and are true to themselves so that they can flourish, you know? And, um, and I, it, the, the wonderful thing to me is that the words mental illness or spiritual emergency for that matter and flourish often have not been together in the same sentence. Mm. So the idea that, you know, uh, flourishing, thriving, joyful, purposeful and mental illness, bipolar disorder, all these things, I think it's really important to continue to hold that. And it's all relative as well. I had a really important um, lesson and experience by a, a parent who went to one of my shows and I, you know, it was about the, one of the shows was about, you know, my recovery or, you know, healing journey. And she came up to me and she said, you know, I think it's really important that you, when you describe recovery, that you describe it in its many variations and its nuances. She said, my son, my son is very affected by, I think, I can't remember if it was, um, schizoaffective or, uh, um, uh, schizophrenia, but, he had a certain level of recovery. He was uh, 
wasn't living independently. Um, he, I think he might have had a volunteer job or so. And so she was just saying that her, she needed to know that, uh, or she wanted me to know that recovery is, is it, it's defined very differently. And quality of life, it doesn't have to look in a certain way. And I think that that's, that's the thing for me is that if I start thinking that it should be, so when I say thriving and flourishing, um, it, my way of flourishing and thriving is going to be different from anybody else's. And um, I think it, it's important because when we do peer support, uh, it's really important to be inspired by those around us, but not use other people as examples in order to beat ourselves up about somehow where we're not. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that in. And to me, that goes back to humility. Mm, yeah. You know, like, I'm, I, <laughs> can I be, much. yeah. Can I be humble enough to acknowledge that I'm limited in my insight into another person's experience? And yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like the, the idea of like, oh, my blind spots, like what other people see that I don't see. That's just like, oh, I go at one point, I, I feel like, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, Esther Hicks. Um, mm -hmm. the, yeah. So they talk about when you croak, right? That's what they, they call them, the croakers. And so I, I, I keep feeling like if I, when I croak, I'm going to have this blast of insight of all the things that I thought I knew about myself that I have no idea, but that everybody else did. And it'll be like this moment of like one mass blush experience not a bliss experience but a blush experience of embarrassment and so uh yeah yeah so anyway <laughs> i have a lot of blish experiences on this podcast <laughs> blish <laughs> that's hilarious i love that i love that blish yes <laughs> well thank you so much could you could you tell people where to go to your website and sign up for your newsletter get your offer you have some free offerings you also have yeah. the ability to download shows yeah absolutely um if you go to www.victoriamaxwell.com um and on the landing page you can sign up for my newsletter you get a how to escape uh, the vicious triangle of anxiety perfectionism and depression um if you're interested in my shows uh, you can go to the products page and there's um downloadable like you can purchase a downloadable link um, and then there's a couple of other free resources there's a, a courage and creativity book list so if people are sort of looking at for books that can inspire their creativity on, on sort of a wide range of things um, and uh, and also uh, there's a mental health resource guide that I created that sort of um, runs the gamut of really traditional um, uh, uh, sort of resources to uh, more um, broad ranging ones, like uh, particularly around boundaries and things like that. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Well, you're, you're such a light. I want to just reflect that back to you that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's inspiring to meet someone who is so in touch with her spirit and also. Um, the humility of what it's like to be human and be limited and don't you, know, you love it though? i just sorry i just, i think it's like that's the thing i said if we all just accept oh my god we're human it's just you know it, it makes life a lot easier because you know you yeah <laughs> and anyway and thank you the last thought i have is it's a play on a zen proverb which is uh before psychosis chop wood carry water after psychosis, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> and, and put on your clothes if it's been a naked one. <laughs> do your best. Just do your best. Yeah, absolutely. Do what's Thanks. most compassionate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, too. Thanks, Chris.